NASA astronaut duo, Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams, are about to return home aboard the Boeing Starliner spacecraft. This is considered their most dangerous mission on the world's most dangerous spacecraft. Starliner incidents from the past to present have raised warnings about the need for lifeboats in case Starliner repeats its own mistakes. And this led to a $26,000 study that NASA recently funded SpaceX. So, how to safely transfer astronauts from an accident Starliner to a lifeboat like SpaceX Crew Dragon? Find out everything in today's TechMap episode. On June 5th, Starliner finally lifted off successfully, with two NASA astronauts on board on its third launch attempt after several years of delay with several technical troubles. The original plan is to spend around eight days in orbit as a test run for the Starliner in its first manned flight before returning to Earth on June 14th. However, as many people feared, the helium leak which had been not completely resolved before launch led to other troubles for the vehicle, including four more helium leaks and the thruster failures en route to the ISS. So have NASA and Boeing sorted out this mess? Well, they haven't, which is why almost two months have passed and the two NASA astronauts are still not back on Earth. As NASA and Boeing told the media, this delay was purposeful meaning they needed to keep the vehicle in space longer to understand more about it rather than it being stranded. A Boeing spokesperson said that the helium leaks and the majority of the thruster problems on the Starliner spacecraft had been deemed stable and not a concern for Starliner's return to Earth. When one doubted why didn't call SpaceX's crew Dragon to bring astronauts home in time and left Starliner empty in space for research, the officials said it was not necessary and those astronauts should stay in orbit to support other tasks there. But when asked about Starliner's return date, they have not yet made an official announcement. To better understand the spacecraft as they said, in addition to the in-space testing on the Starliner, NASA and Boeing have already done a test campaign at the White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico to replicate how the thrusters were used during the flight. The test objectives were to find the root cause of the thruster malfunction and the potential impact of reactivating these thrusters on the mission's overall performance and safety. The test was kicked off in early July and lasted for roughly three weeks. On July 18th, according to the update on the Boeing website, the ground testing is complete and teams are now turning their attention to data reviews. Boeing and NASA engineers will proceed with thruster disassembly and inspections and move forward with finalizing flight rationale in support of readiness reviews for Starliner's nominal return to Earth with Commander Butch Wilmore and pilot Suni Williams in the coming weeks, the statement said. It's possible that Starliner will stay in space until the end of the summer, but this will directly affect the schedule for its first official mission in February 2025. It's unclear whether NASA will certify the new spacecraft in time. Even if it did, it would likely conduct just a handful of flights before NASA retires the space station in 2030. Additionally, it could still be used to service the Orbital Reef orbiting station under development by Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin company. However, in September 2023, it was rumored that Blue Origin and Sierra Space were looking to end the Orbital Reef Space Station partnership. This sparks the concern that Boeing would not fully fill out Starliner's manifest. Anyway, how many missions Starliner will fly now is not the biggest concern, but whether it will be safe enough to bring people home or not. While things are still unclear, on July 15th, SpaceX was awarded $26,700 for Emergency Response Special Research. This follows the July 10th press conference. Steve Stick, program manager for NASA's Commercial Crew Program, mentioned NASA had looked at Dragon contingency per Butch and Suni waiting for Starliner to be cleared for return. This sparked speculation about Crew Dragon's urgent role in Starliner's CFT mission. Nevertheless, to respond, the agency explained that the study is not related to Starliner. NASA continuously explores a wide range of contingency options with our partners to ensure crew safety aboard the International Space Station. Over the past couple of years, the agency has worked with its commercial partner SpaceX to provide additional return capability on the Dragon spacecraft in the event of a contingency. To put it simply, it sounds like NASA is trying to figure out if a quick launch of Crew Dragon is possible in response to certain emergencies.
NASA noted this does not mean anything is wrong with Starliner, but given what happened, NASA might want to keep its options open. To be honest, it's so good to always keep options open. NASA's manager of the program, Steve Stich, although denying rumors of plans to call on SpaceX for help, also did not completely deny that possibility. The beautiful thing about the commercial crew program is that we have two vehicles, two different systems, that we could use to return crew, he said. So we have a little bit more time to go through the data and then make a decision as to whether we need to do anything different. Assume that while the Starliner is bringing the astronaut home, but runs into trouble on the way down, similar to what happened on the way up, the Space Dragon could quickly mount a rescue mission. Frankly, with the current flight cadence of SpaceX's Dragon and Falcon 9, this might pose a bit of a challenge. An assembled rocket sitting in a hangar, fully tested, could be launched within a short time, maybe 24 hours, my guess. In the case of that, they are being launched as unmanned lifeboats. And of course, in launchable condition, you could take considerably higher risks, like skipping a wet dress rehearsal. Just get it on the pad, fuel it up, and if no flags come up during the countdown, you light the candle. If only one got ready to launch, but with the favorable external factors such as favorable weather and the crisis allowing for a few days, you could do some testing to increase your chance of a successful launch. These lead us to NASA's Emergency Response Special Research. Imagine you had a robust contingency setup to respond to unexpected situations efficiently. If a full contingency setup is in place, it can significantly reduce the time required to prepare for a launch, potentially bringing it down to single-digit hours. Clearly, it's not the first time NASA has come up with research about rescue missions. There was actually an exercise done to work this out at the direction of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board CAIB. It comes from the pain caused by the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. On Saturday, February 1, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia was lost and seven NASA astronauts perished. NASA could have tried to launch Space Shuttle Atlantis on a rescue mission if they had known Columbia was going to disintegrate on re-entry. Yet, how would they have gotten the astronauts down? While Columbia was on orbit, Atlantis was undergoing preparations for a March 1 launch as STS-114. It would have been possible, albeit a difficult and demanding race against time, to launch Atlantis on a rescue mission. Columbia would have faced a 30-day mission limit, determined by its supply of lithium hydroxide scrubbers used to remove CO2 from the cabin atmosphere, and additional limits posed by food, water, and power supplies. Depending on when the decision was made to launch a rescue, Atlantis could have rendezvoused with Columbia as early as mission day 27 with the launch prep and flight crews working a brutal 24-7 schedule and no room for error or delays, but it was at least feasible. In the Kaibe scenario, Atlantis would have launched with a four-person crew of two pilots and two mission specialists to conduct the EVAs. Meanwhile, Columbia's crew would have powered down the orbiter and adopted a max conservation routine, essentially staying in their bunks as much as possible to conserve oxygen and minimize CO2. Once Atlantis rendezvoused with Columbia, the two EVA astronauts would have connected the orbiters with an extendable boom. They would transfer two EVA suits to Columbia, meeting two already suited Columbia astronauts and helping them transfer to Atlantis. The remaining astronauts would relay the EVA suits back and forth in a grueling eight-nine hour spacewalk. Finally, the last two crewmen would have set up Columbia for control from Houston. Atlantis would back away and prepare for re-entry Columbia would be set up for deorbit and a final fiery re-entry, presumably to Point Nemo in the South Pacific, the most remote spot on Earth, and where the majority of controlled deorbitings are targeted. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.